ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المحتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ان ان الله يعمر بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون Brothers, sisters, alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair for really coming to this very important event. Now, there is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa It's narrated by hadith uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu an. And it just goes to explain why we are addressing this particular issue. And he mentioned in this hadith that the companions used to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about the khair, about the good. But I used to ask him about the shar, the evil, for fear that it might catch hold of me. So this is an important principle. That Part of our responsibility as educators, as teachers, as guides, as du'at, okay, in terms of enjoining good and forbidding evil, is exactly that responsibility. To warn not just Muslims, but the whole of society, because remember this message that we're talking about, the message of Islam, is really a shifa for all of humanity. And it provides solutions for most of the human ills and evils which are out there. So this is our responsibility. Because if we allow evil to spread, then this is going to affect everyone. Now one of the things that often that Muslim parents say to me is this. They say to me that don't talk to my children about these particular issues because if you talk to them about them then they'll get these ideas into their head and they're more likely to do it. Now again this is much more of this. Is, this basically this attitude is called brushing everything under the carpet, living in denial. And I've got to say the reality of what we call the pornification of society, the over-sexualization which is taking place, it's a global epidemic where pornography is something which is so widespread, so accessible, and as I'll explain, so addictive, so corrosive, so destructive to society, to spirituality, to everything about... Porn is one of the most anti-human things that you can do. And I'm going to prove this, not just from an Islamic source, but most of the sources I'm going to use are from the generic research which is out there, from the community which is anti-porn community, because they see the impact, of the destructive impact of, that it's having, in particular on the younger generation. Because we now have an unprecedented episode in uh, you know, what we call uh, pornography and what porn, the porn that is being presented to society. So we've got to be aware of this evil. If you think your children are, are innocent, I wish they were, I wish their fitra is intact. But the nature of this society is such that porn is everywhere. In fact, many people now, and many of the academics, and the leading kind of uh, 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 thinkers in this particular area, they say that porn is now so embedded in mainstream pop culture. It's not something which is an embarrassment. You know, going back in the days, it used to be a bit of an embarrassment. It used to be something which people saw as a bit of a joke. You know, top shelf, dirty old men in overcoats, going with crumpled brown and you know bags, taking these magazines out. You know, it was inaccessible to most people. Most people were embarrassed and shy about it. You know, you have now mainstream individuals. Just to give you an idea. You know, uh, this is one example. My Joe Farage, who's the head of a political party, it's not a political point. He spoke about the fact that he goes to strip clubs. He was not embarrassed about the fact that he goes to strip clubs and watches lap dances. And he felt that, oh, this is not sexist at all. This is a leader, this is a so-called leader in this society who's saying such a thing. When this is a behaviour, would he allow his own daughter and sister to do such a thing? To dance for money in front of other people who are just looking at her as a piece of meat. Not as a human being, with a soul. You know, and this is why porn, one of the aspects of porn that I'm going to explain, porn is really about justice as well. That you would treat, we, our basic etiquette as Muslims, treat others as we would want to be treated ourselves. We give justice to humanity. This is part of Adl, our justice imperative. To allow someone to be prostituted, treated like meat, used, abused and discarded, which is what happens to girls who are in the porn industry. They are just used, abused and discarded like pieces of meat, as insignificant trash and nothing. Would we allow that for our sisters and daughters? So we can't allow it for anyone, others, anyone else's sister and daughter. That just goes to show you the mainstream, mainstream aspect of it. Porn has become mainstream because you see it 
in pop videos, you see on billboards, you see in magazines, it's on your phone, it's on your Bluetooth, it's on your internet, it's on every single communicative medium. Not only just porn, whether it's in rap videos, whether it's in the lyrics of songs. Just to give you an idea how mainstream porn has become now. The biggest selling book last year is called Fifty Shades of Grey. It's a porn book. It's a book which is about sadomasochism. And I excuse the listeners, I'm going to use particular language. I can't shy away from this language. This is the language of the street. I'm going to be, try to be as modest as possible in my conduct. But I'm going to have to use particular language okay, to explain what we're talking about here, to show us the real reality of what we're confronted with. And that how we as Muslims need to be at the forefront of the anti-pornification of society movement. See, look, Fifty Shades of Grey is a book about sadomasochism, about a housewife who allows a man to beat her, whip her, torture her, humiliate her, and guess what? She loves it. And this is the biggest selling book that was there last year. They're going to make the film of it now. A book like that, 5, 10, 15 years ago, would have been nothing, would have been, would have been laughed about. But again, it shows also that those people who are advocating for justice for women, they're failing as well, that women now think, oh, this is perfectly all right. Porn is fun. It's something which is a diversion. Actually, I can exercise my freedom of choice and do these kind of things. So this is called to show you the, the, the perversion that's taking place. Porn, is, like I said, has become mainstream. You know, you've got, uh, and, and even politicians are talking about this now, what they call the sexualization of society. Cameron's talking about it, but it's a bit late for Cameron to talk about it. As they say, you know, they're trying to close the door now. The horse, the horse has very much bolted a long time ago. They want to put more filters on the internet to prevent children from accessing pornography. It's too late. You deregulated, you liberalized. All of these industries which are related to this, gambling, okay, alcohol, uh, you know, the, the, the sex industry, all of these were deregulated. Censorship was deregulated. As a result, you liberalized society. Now you want to close it down. And you can't close it down because, there, you know, just to give you an idea, there are 24 million, 24 million porn sites around the world. Just to give you an idea, some of the statistics that we're talking about here in terms of uh, uh, the level you know, of this activity that's taking place. You know, 24 million, uh, you know, 24% of internet searches directly related to pornography. 24 million porn sites. 68 million daily searches for pornography. 72 million people visiting porn regularly every month. Okay, 13,000 porn videos produced or porn films produced every year. And Hollywood only produces 600. So it's the most prolific film industry in the world. 28,000 viewers every second. We're talking about the power of mass media here and social media now. This is how this is a big game changer. 28,000 people. We're losing a battle. We are losing a battle in terms of, obviously, we have our brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, have come here. We've got the tens and twenties coming to the masjids and to the talks and things like that. 28,000 people per second. $3,000 per second. It is a $13.3 billion industry. That's bigger than Amazon, bigger than eBay, bigger than Microsoft. It shows you the size of this industry. It is a capitalist <coughs> machine that is driven by exploitation of the vulnerable. This multi-billion pound injury. Now, just to give you an idea, mobile phone porn, one billion dollars a year. Now, 420, 420 million pages. 89% of all the porn in the world comes from the United States. I, I, I didn't get the statistics on who the biggest consumers are. I think someone might be able to give us that facts later. But what's interesting, when you do look at the consumption figures for pornography, in proportional terms, Middle East, South Asia, these are some of the highest consumers of this porn around the world. Now, the age, as, uh, as, as Sheikh Masood mentioned, most, the, the average age at which, and this affects obviously, this is an epidemic for young men, our sons, who if we don't control this behavior, will go on to become dis sexually dysfunctional, unable to sustain normal relationships and potentially violently sex sexually violent towards women and sexual abusers. This is the reality, the research it says this. The big cover-up is that people want to say, oh, just because people watch porn, it doesn't mean that they're going to rape. The research, it shows that. This is what the research says. People who regularly watch porn are de de have decreased empathy for violence against women. 
Why? Because they're immersing themselves in a culture in which women are being tortured, gagged, choked, slapped, sworn at, urinated on, and the list goes on because I have to be sensitive to our audience. If you're watching this material, and your heart, this is the, the key thing in all of the porn discourse you'll find out there, no disagreement upon it, it causes desensitization. You get dumbed down. You get numb to what you're actually watching. So you have decreased empathy for violence against women, for rape against women. You feel, people who are watching porn in this way, immersed in porn, they said women dressed provocatively deserve to be raped. And it's not just provocatively. See, this is the thing about the really perverse genres of porn out there. They've, they've made it such because the nature is it, uh, as I'll explain, is that in order to capture the audience still, to give the new type of porn, they come up with all kinds of bizarre and novel ideas. Arab girl porn, Pakistani girl porn, okay? Uh, Pakistani girl gets, uh, gets gang raped porn. That's, that's what we've got out there as they try to. Yeah, because what it is is that once you've watched one level, I'll explain it in the addiction process, how the psychology and the, uh, like I said, the, you know, the, the process in terms of how the brain is affected by porn. But once you've watched one level of porn, you, you develop a tolerance. And then you start constantly seeking a harder hit, a more degrading porn, a more violent porn. They interviewed uh, child rapists in prison in America, research on child rapists in prison. These guys, first time they raped a child, even mentioning that is something which is, is reprehensible, even to think of that. Islam is a religion which is about protection of children. You know, the female child buried alive, you know, he said, for what crime was I killed? That ayah is an imperative for us to protect children. So child rapists were asked, okay, you know, when they, well, did they watch child pornography? And to give you an idea, there are 100,000 websites out there which are child porn websites. 100,000 of them. And then there are many, many other th thousands and thousands of porn sites which are called barely legal. It's a type of genre which the girls look underaged, but they say it's legal, i.e. over 18, to perform that. And the whole idea is that guys get off on seeing barely legal children being sexually abused in every orifice. That's what they get off on. And uh, so these rapists, these child rapists, they were asked, you know, well, the first time they saw child porn, what was their feeling? And they said we, they were disgusted when they saw child porn for the second, first time. Then after the first experience, this is a thing, as we know, when a black spot is placed in your heart, when you sin, you have a weakness now. It pulls, there's a pull. Porn gives you a pull back to it. Unless you reboot, reprogram, and decode all of that programming. I'll explain how that's going to be done, inshallah. You know, you, you, you know, and so they're pulled back to it. And then they started actually watching the child porn. Six months later, they raped a child. That's what it did. Child porn. You know, we wouldn't have managed 20 years ago that incest porn would be something which would become a norm in society. Why has incest porn become a norm in society? The reason it has is because I said, if porn became mainstream, then what happened to the porn industry? They had to get more and more, harder and harder, and more and more extreme. Because they said, you know, if, if most pop videos are now what would be considered 10, 15 years ago as pornographic, remember the stuff that happened on TV a couple of years ago, that there were pop, uh, you know, on the Saturday night shows, X Factor and the likes, there were performances by various artists that caused enormous amount of complaints because they were considered as pornographic, so that they clamped down a bit. So that just goes to show you, pre-Watershed, 9pm in this country, you know, they've got uh, uh, pornographic material. And the reality, unfortunately, now is on terrestrial TV, they have a whole series of soft porn, ch soft porn channels now. So if that's gone mainstream, that is it. And it was in the sun anyway. Soft porn was always in the th page three. The fact that a mainstream tabloid paper, the most popular paper in this whole country, its iconic page is page three, a page where a woman is topless, that men buy it for this purpose, in itself shows what kind of society that we're living in. What is the real respect and value for women if this is an iconic paper? 
And I, I understand the Sun wanted to get rid of it. I don't know how they, if they've got rid of page three yet. But there are other papers who are just waiting to take that, that paper's place if it does get rid of it. So if porn went mainstream, then what happened to the porn industry? The porn industry then realized okay, that we have to go harder and harder. And that's how porn has become part of the culture and embedded inside. So this new type of porn, this is what the internet has done, the big game changer of the internet. You see, they couldn't have done this with just magazines and how pornography and strip bars and, and prostitution was there. How it did it is that gonzo porn is this new porn. Gonzo porn is a degrading, violent format. I gave evidence at the Children's Commissioner's inquiry. She is doing an uh, inquiry into, and at the House of Commons, uh, they're doing an into, in, inquiry into child sexual exploitation. The work that I do with young offenders, we found out that young men were watching this porn in groups together, spoke, smoking and taking alcohol and drugs together. And then what, guess what? They were involved in abusing girls together. It's a natural progression that one thing led to another thing led to another thing. Now they're watching gonzo porn because the porn makers in the industry, this multi-billion pound industry that continue, wants to continue to make uh, money, realize the only way we can do it is by producing things that people haven't seen before. And there are formats out there which are so abhorrent. For example, there is a format around rape. There's rape porn. It's something called revenge porn now. Which is like when you get your own back on someone, then you do you know, a porn film about them or something like this. You know, one of the worst, uh, th th there's things called double penetration, where you know, multiple males will penetrate a woman in every orifice. And even that is considered a soft porn now. A soft. How can something like that be considered as soft? And, and, and the whole desensitization process, people watch this and they don't bat an eyelid. See, part of the process of getting over the addiction, as I'll show you, is understanding what's going on, what they're doing to your brain, what shaitan and his awliya are doing to your brain. When you understand this, you realize the sickness of this, then you start to pull away from such an abusive and corrosive behavior. Another format is called ATM. And this is a form, of ex and, and, I, and, and ex I have to excuse you, but I want people to wake up to the reality of what's out there. And this format is, is called, and, and this is the software, anus to mouth. And it means penetrating a woman's anus, then after, uh, you know, orally raping her. Again, what, you know, what are you saying about women when you allow this kind of behavior to take place in society? And, and, and someone watches this uncritically, and, and, and as I said, children, young men, our young men, all of the young men in our society that I care about, are being exposed to this at the age of 11. By the age 16 to 18, some statistics say 60%, others say 80% of, of young men have been exposed to porn and watch it. 80%. And as I'll show you, even the first experience that you have of porn leaves a trace leaves damage in the brain that can't be reversed. That's the nature of pornography. Leaving aside the fact that what we have here, you know, you are not looking at this woman as a woman, as a sister, as a daughter. There are so many books out there of survivors of the porn industry who are now speaking out against this particular, this, this, you know, absolutely reprehensible, wicked industry. It is a hate crime. A hate crime. It is hate speech. You, do you know if I said this kind of stuff about a non-Muslim? A Muslim said this about a non-Muslim. The kind of stuff that is said in these videos. The treatment, the torture, the humiliation, the degradation, the, uh, the abuse, the violent language. If I use that as a Muslim to a non-Muslim, I would be convicted under the anti-terror laws, under incitement to religious hatred, etc, etc. So how can this stuff even be legal? It's because it's a multi-billion pound capitalist industry that is about exploitation, that's why. And it's about destroying societies. And this is why the other aspect of it, I call it the P-bomb, the porn bomb. You heard me say before, you know there's a general in the, I think, 80s, he says we don't need to bomb countries. All we need to do is send them Baywatch. That was in the 80s. Baywatch is a program, uh, and they had scantily clad women in this particular pro program. What does he say? What does he mean by this uh, comment? 
He means socially re-engineering societies. Societies that were conservative, had strong values, had a you know, particular status quo. As soon as satellite te television came into those societies, they became global. Then those societies, their value system started to change. And we've seen, you know, Yemen's a prime example of the parts of Yemen. I heard about villages which were conservative, you know, which were very, you know, uh, had their values strong, conservative Islamic values. As soon as the satellite dishes are purged all over the place, people started to access porn all around the world. Free porn. It's free as well. And there's a reason it's free, because it creates an addiction, then the person then starts to pay afterwards. Because every drug pusher will give you the first uh, uh, drug that he gives you, the first spliff, the first line of cocaine. It's always free to hook you on. And then it becomes your lifestyle, and you become completely immersed and addicted in it. So this is the porn bomb. It's a global bomb. Now, one of the interesting articles I read in The Economist, it was, what is the uh, similarity between Iceland not the, uh, that's not the shop, by the way, that's the country Iceland, and uh, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> what's, the com what's the similarity? And the similarity is that both Iceland, now Iceland, like a lot of the other, you know, although it's not a Scandinavian country, but like Sweden and a lot of the other Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries, it's got a very liberal attitude towards sex. And they had strip bars, and they had sex shops, and all of that kind of stuff in there. But Iceland has decided to ban online pornography, just like Saudi Arabia has obviously got a ban on online pornography, although there's other ways that it comes in. Why? Because anyone who thinks rationally is recognizing the impact that it is having on this next generation. Because we're not talking about pornography anymore, we're talking about humiliation and degradation. Kids, 11, 12, 13, exposed to this material, watching hours and hours of it a day, how it's changing their social attitudes and what we're creating is a future where these children will then come, go on to become abusers. Like I said in the research, okay, you know, uh, is it women dressed provocatively deserve to be raped. Some more of the research. That young men who watch por pornography became angry when a woman who they made advances to refused their advances. And they feel that they have what we call entitlement. Now, anyone who knows anything about sexual exploitation and sexual abuse, Jimmy Savile was the biggest, most prolific sexual abuser that there's been in this country. Over a thousand individuals he is alleged to have abused. 450 have been identified. He operated with impunity. He thought he could do what he wanted. No one challenged his behavior. The other thing, entitlement. Anyone who I want to grope, abuse, and have sex with, well, I can have sex with. That's the same thing that porn does to you. It creates this idea that, oh, why does this woman refuse my advances? You know, why is it she just accepted me? Was I? It de and this is the next thing. Research has shown is that pornography decreases your interest in your own wife in a healthy, normal sex, sex life. Why? Because you become, the, the addiction to porn means this. That you get such a hit on this. And, and I'll explain the whole process. You get such a hit from watching porn that your normal sex life becomes something which is boring, bo boring and you become desensitized. De uh, and the last part of this research, what is identified, there is an increased coercion of your wife or your partners. And I've dealt with this as a counsellor where, you know, wives have complained how their husbands have forced them to do and engage in violent sexual acts. Forced them to do this. And when we've investigated why, I often ask, why did you do this? We find that that husband has been watching pornography and he's trying to enact the porn formats in his own marital life. And again, treating his wife like a porn star rather than... You see, in Islam, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions the whole idea of zawaj, of marriage. You know, in this ayah, min ayatihi an khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwajin li taskunu, that Allah ta'ala created from the man, his partner. They live together in tranquility. And he said, إِلَيْهِ وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ وَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And from that comes love and mercy. So what defines the relationship in Islam is rahm, love and mercy, compassion, softness, emotional care, support, kindness, creating tranquility in the home. Porn as a format is about humiliation, degradation, abuse. There's no love. You see, one of the aspects, that a lot of uh, uh, research in this field, they say you can see there's no love in porn because there's no kissing. It's all about, you know, the sexual act. And even in the sexual act, you see, one of the things that uh, is what they call in porn, and this in itself sub sums up how porn is completely misogynistic. Misogynistic, you know, often people say Islam is a religion which, uh, you know, treats women as second class and has a misogynistic tendencies. Na'uzu billah. 
not the true Islam of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sunnah. The most misogynistic culture in the world is a culture which allows these mediums. Which completely dehumanizes thousands. And then what you have as a result of the pornification of society is that girls now aspire to be lap dancers, to be porn stars, glamour models. In fact, when they had a survey in this country a couple of years ago about what kind of careers girls would want, those are the kind of careers that came in the top ten. Why? Because there's a pornification of child. I've got all the research, I haven't got time to go through all of it because I've got a lot to get through. Uh, you know, what was identified, children as young as 9, 10, 11, being sexualized by all these mediums. You have lingerie companies launching sexy lingerie for 11 and 12 year olds. With, with you know, insignias on that, on, on the underwear, you know, that was being sold, it was an insignia. And this is again, pornification of the mainstream. You go into a shop, you see it. You know, a thong for an 11 or 12 year old, a G-string for an 11, with words written on it, call me, call me. This is a mainstream company that produced this particular material. I don't even want to talk about it. There's another mainstream artist just this week, mainstream company in this society, Littlewoods, catalogue, produced a bikini range for children. So, so what, this is again part of this pornification, children and social media. In fact, you know, what we know and the Children's uh, Commission's inquiry shows this is the impact of the porn that children are being exposed to now. That children are posting naked images of themselves on Facebook. Children and, and, and through social media. And this is what we call the pimping out of children. And what we also have is various social media signs collecting these particular images as well. Because they have a right, as we know, the images you post, they collect them and they, and they have access to these particular images. There's no embarrassment or shame now associated with the porn culture. You know that hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, from the first parts of Revelation, is the words, if you feel no shame, then do as you wish. It has two meanings. That means, when you have haya, the sense of modesty, haya comes from the word hayat, it means life. Haya, as the Prophet said, is half of Iman. And Haya is fundamentally that before my Creator Allah, I have a sense of modesty. And I guard my behavior. And I have a sense of embarrassment and shame. Shame and embarrassment, modesty, is a joke in this society. It's a joke, it's a weakness. You say, oh, it's a modest, shy person. It's considered as something which is, Im rather you have to be a sexualized, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, being, this is the one that is, sees, uh, is seen as having approval or acceptance in, in the society. So, again, it's that breaking down, and that's why, as you said, if people feel no shame, because the, the, the boundaries have been broken down so much that they will behave as they will. And it is, and it, like I said, this porn is anti-human behavior. It's anti-human. Not even animals do what we're talking about. If I say it's animalistic, that's, that's, that's dishonoring animal. Animals don't do. You see, when they were talking about how will gonzo porn go to the next, and so there was a porn producer who was writing, we'll go for quadruple penetration. And they have this other format, which is about penetrating women so much that it leaves them gaping. And you actually call it, you know, watch the gape, that's what they call it. Animals don't do that. You know, animals do not inflict such harm on it. So you can't even call it animalistic behavior. It is anti-human behavior. It's also anti-sex. See, when people, when I am involved in this debate with people, I say, I'm involved in this debate. I'm, I campaign against porn, not because I'm a Muslim, although Alhamdulillah informs my core values and who I am and what I'm about. It's because this is, like I said, this is an anti-human behavior that destroys society. It destroys the mind, I will see. It destroys your body, it destroys your soul, it destroys society, it destroys families, it destroys children's lives. You know, it's responsible in so much aspects of criminality and crime, the list goes on. Okay, and it's also anti-sex. You see, in Islam, alhamdulillah, we believe that sex, okay, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, this is something, you know, Allah ta'ala, he's, he, you know, we have, uh, he's given us this as a gift, alhamdulillah. It's a beautiful thing in our religion, Sex is sadaqah. It's something which you are rewarded for. There's a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, which states that the Prophet said, when the husband gives pleasure to his wife and they enjoy each other, they get ajr, reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The companions on hearing this were amazed. He said, when we enjoy our wives, are you saying that 
you know we get reward he said yes because it's something done in the halal way i.e within the institution of marriage and not in the haram way through fornication and adultery and the haram methods outside of marriage this is something which is rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even when Allah ta'ala look how Allah ta'ala describes the relationship of a husband and wife they are garments for one another. She is a garment for you, you are a garment for her. It's a beautiful description of the intimacy, of the love, of the kindness, of the mercy, of the softness, of the, of the tranquility, of the mercy between two people who are intimate with one another. Porn destroys masculinity. Because men think it means being a, a being rijal, man, is about you know, abusing women in these ways. It destroys femininity because women think they have to prostitute themselves. And it destroys intimacy because people no longer have a normal kind of sexual life. It becomes they have a totally distorted programming. And mo like I said, men who watch pornography become so desensitized. There's something called porn-induced erectile dysfunction. Because uh, they're so used to getting the high from the porn that when they come to their normal relationships, they are, are unable to function. So is that not anti-sex or if that's, a, you know, and then on top of that, like I said, men and women watching pornography, watching men copulating and men and women copulating, making zina with one another, something we should feel so much shame about, embarrassment about, but we're so desensitized to that. Watching men in an aroused state, again it creates, it blurs all of these boundaries about what is acceptable sexuality or not. It completely blurs all of this thing. Then on top of that, there's the violence which is in pornography. Like I said, the slapping, the abusing, the, the, the language, the violent language, which is so mainstream. I did a session this week with the social workers, and I put up the rap video lyrics on the wall. And one uh, attendant, attendant there, one person who came to the session, who used to listen to that particular artist, Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre is not an annual rapper, he's a mainstream rapper. He runs the multi-billion pound industry. He's artists like Eminem and Little Kim and all these kind of people. He does these Beats headphones. That's why I say boycott Beats headphones. Don't, uh, you know, and our youth out there, they want to buy the Beats headphones. It's the item to have. He is a person that peddles misery and corruption. And yet, you know, you've got mainstream celebrities selling his... And when I put the lyrics up, they're so obscene, I can't even talk about them. I can't even mention the lyrics that he puts up. I put them up in terms of how he was referring to women, what has to be done to women, how they're discarded and abused afterwards. person used to listen to the lyrics, they said, I just listened to it. I didn't know he's saying this kind of stuff. Now that I know he's saying this kind of material, I won't listen to it. Eminem, you know, he uses the same, same thing. He says, you know, in another, he says, you know, you know, uses the B word. You don't think I won't choke no whore until the vocal cords in her throat don't work no more. This is Eminem. I'm going to choke you whore till your vocal cords don't, cords don't work no more. So this is the kind of violent pornograph pornographic language that we have as well. Children consuming it uncritically. And so music and porn culture have also mixed. And there's actually so much research out there about how porn has gone, uh, embedded itself now in rap, uh, in rap videos and in the music video culture anyway. And that's why the actual porn industry had to go even harder and harder. Okay. Porn is constructing people's views of what is appropriate and acceptable behavior and values. Because our kids, and this is one of the more, most important things, that just before someone was asking, they were having uh, some issues with their son who is on WhatsApp all the time in a group talking to girls and things like that. They're concerned, you know, about the Muslim son, you know, having a relationship, a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. And look. The key thing here is this, one of the most important things here in order to be preventative, to prevent our kids being influenced by this evil in the future, let's talk to our kids. We need to talk to them about the risks out there in society. Put the strong value system in there so that they become lil mutakina imami, the champions out there that are championing for the truth and for justice and the goodness and morality in society, not like their peers who are doing the complete opposite. We've got to talk to our kids. We've got to have a mature, open discussion with them. And I say to all my young uh, brothers and sisters here, that if you have any issue that you're going to be confronted with, and often this is about peer pressure, people putting pressure on you to watch material. They want to put pressure on you to do this. Because even though they're trying to destroy your fitrah, they want to make you impure and unclean. They want to destroy you. That's what they want to do. Because they're going in the gutter. People want to pull you into the gutter. They don't want you to rise above this. 
There's peer pressure out there. The street is the main educator for children at the moment, and the internet is the second uh, is another big educator. Forget about schools. Schools are again failing in providing strong value-based education for our children. The street, and we know this. I presented this evidence. This is the kids that we work. The street, their role models on the street, negative role models, and the internet is their educator. So porn and gonzo porn has become their educator on on the streets there. So we need to talk to our kids. And they need to talk to us. And if you feel that you can't talk to your parents because you're embarrassed, you know, you know you're going to be embarrassed talking to your parents, then at least go to someone else, an uncle, an older person. You can come to me anytime. And I'll talk to anyone confidentially. I won't tell anyone. See, I think some of our children, they fear, oh, you're going to label us, you're going to judge us, you're going to tell our parents, and things like that. No, this is amana. We have to give counselling and support to our children who are vulnerable to these risks out there in society. We can't be with you 24-7, you see. And the nature of it is that it's so pervasive, it's everywhere. So you've got to talk to someone. Don't let the issues run. I've, I've given counselling to, to, to people in their 20s who started having problems 11, 12, 13. They suffered with them for years because there's no one that they, go, they could go to and talk to about their problems. They had to suffer for years until they could find someone and then open up with their problems. So please, all my young brothers and sisters here, if you feel that you're under pressure, if, some, if you feel that there are negative things in your life, then go and talk to, you know, uh, like I said, an older person and, and someone who can give you some mature guidance in this matter. And we should equip ourselves to deal with these challenges which are out there in society. So the porn industry has hijacked what is uh, decency, morality, and what is called a healthy approach to sex and relationship issues is destroyed that, is destroyed the issue of, for example, marriage. It destroys the foundation of marriage. Because really, you know, most people, they don't even a partner now. They're married to the internet. Guys are married to the internet. They're watching hit after hit after hit, you know. And uh, the other thing about the other aspects, as we know, I touched on it. You know, porn is, a misogyn is the most misogynistic medium in the world. It hates, porn hates women. Porn produces hate women. Because if they, if they had any love for them, then they wouldn't produce this kind of material. And the sign, the indicator that porn is so misogynistic is this idea that, you know, there's something called the money shot in porn. This is the most important thing in porn. And this is where, and excuse the language, a man, okay, the, the man then ejaculates over the female. Because she's not even worthy of the seed. She's not even worthy of that. She's just going to be, like I said, you know, you just ejaculate over her and that's it. You know, and, and, and worse than that. And that shows you the misogynistic aspect of this whole. Not only that, it's also about, you know, pornography also has through it racism all the way through this as well. You know, I couldn't use racial stereotypes. And as we know, Islam is completely against racism in every, one, every way, shape and form. And racism, you know, people will say is unacceptable in society. But you know, porn reinforces every racist stereotype out there. And the genres of porn as well reinforce it. You know, in rape porn, why are the men in rape porn black? Generally, that's the case. Why are they black? And the girls who are being raped, not black, white. What it, this is profoundly racist. I'm not saying this. All of the, the researchers and key uh, advocates in this area are saying this. And I just want to talk about one of them, you know, one of the national, you know, champions out there, Gail Dines is her name. She's a sociology professor and she's done a lot of anti-porn work out there. And, you know, where we see people who are doing good work like this, we support this because Allah says in the Quran, <laughs> Cooperate with one another upon goodness and righteousness, not upon sin and transgression. So this, she's doing good work in this field. So you know, we should promote this and it's a good website where she has good resources. And so she talks about this, you know, okay, these are the things she says. That because of the desensitization, porn is getting harder and harder. Boys are being reared on cruel and violent pornography. 11 year olds, she said 33% of 13 year olds, 80% of 60 year olds, 16 year olds, 63% of young people said they have ease of access to pornography via their uh, phones. Okay, and this, she says, will have a profound long-term impact on society. An acceptance of violence towards women also, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and she also found in her research that uh, in American universities and the nurses, they were saying they were picking up more and more cases of anal rape. Okay, uh, again, why? Because this is again part of it. Uh, and, you know, I won't talk about some of the other kind of worse stuff. She also said girls are accepting this behavior. Girls are wannabe porn stars because they've realized that 
you know, uh, this to be gain acceptance from males, they have to prostitute and pimp themselves out. So that's why the clothing industry then feeds on this, but providing this sexualized clothing for children as well. Uh, as, you know, and then you know, and, and this used to be a two taboo, as I said, the taboo of child uh, sex. This child sex taboo has been broken. It's been broken. You know, because of this. Now this has changed in the last 20 years. All of this. So what's it going to be in the next 20 years? Unless we start to challenge this behaviour. Like I said, what used to be a hidden and underground culture is the mainstream culture out there, driven by this billion pound porn industry that has celebrities driving this and building, bringing out harder and harder corn that is dehumanising. And like I said, all of these different genres which are out there. I'm going to come on to how porn is a drug. And in fact, you know, it's one of the most addictive drugs, you know, in the addiction work that I've done. You know, it's up there with crack cocaine in terms of its addictiveness and the number of, you know, if you're, if you're looking at the fact that, you know, we're talking nearly 75 million people in the world who watch porn regularly, so then have aspects of addiction. One of the aspects of the addiction, there's, you know, there's an addiction scale and one of the things is when someone is pre overly preoccupied with that, you're spending more time thinking about it and doing it. I've worked with guys who, have been, who watch porn for hours and hours five, six hours at a time, multiply masturbating at the same time. That's the kind of level of uh, addiction. We're talking about another aspect of a lot of addiction is deception and lying. People covering up their behavior. And you'll see that if you're covering up your behavior. Okay, and one of the aspects I always say about covering up behavior, you know, it's a sign that someone is a porn addict. They learn how to cover their behavior up. They, they, they have the window washer program on and they clear their history. I always say, you've cleared your history, but Allah hasn't cleared your history. <laughs> Allah is aware of your history. You see, sometimes it's part of the decent, oh, I've got rid of my history, no one will know. Allah knows. Allah is fully aware of all of your actions. This is why for us, the Islamic framework in terms of porn, uh, uh, solving porn addiction, Alhamdulillah, is such a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I'll show you. Having looked at the other kind of porn addiction treatments and therapies, what Allah has given us is remarkable and amazing in order. And we can share this with the whole of humanity. I want to go through the evils of porn. I'm going to list them all. There's so many. The evils of porn. Desires and lusts are increased. It, it makes us base. It's driven by base desires. Animalistic desires. Destroys the character. No generosity. It makes you selfish. Self-centered. Individualistic. Concerned about yourself. It creates anger, enmity, hatred towards other. It sexualizes the mindset and distorts reality because people are just looking at it from that lens that they have, a sexualized lens of the world. Porn leaves a mental imprint in your brain. And this is a lifelong imprint. Because this is different theories of, 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 of how our memory. A porn image will just stay there. It stays there as a print in your brain. And it can be rewired. And you can write other stuff over it, which take it, but it will still be there. Okay, it's a destructive behavior because of the addiction that it leads to. The, the levels of perversion that comes from it. And as, it, as I mentioned, you know, some of, the, some of the formats I don't even mention because I'm even shy to even mention them. And I've mentioned incest and child, okay, porn are just two of the aspects of porn. Like I said, these are two boundaries that we, that are, uh, people have gone through and, and they are nonchalant about. Okay, it wastes your time. It wastes phenomenal amounts of time. It creates debt and financial problems. People have lost their jobs, failed their exams, lost their families, supporting the, and, and you're supporting, when you're watching these, you're supporting this whole industry. Awliya of the Ta'ud here. You know, we talk about fighting against Shaitan and his awliya by supporting this whole industry, by watching that you're supporting this whole industry, like I said, which is a global epidemic of evil that is being spread. You're supporting exploitation. You're supporting the exploitation of these sisters and daughters and mothers by watching this particular. That's what I'm saying. When you become, you see the harsh reality of it and realize this is not fun. This isn't a release. This isn't something which is, oh, you know, gives me a bit of a break. No, you're supporting Zulam. And the more you support it, you're there too. You know, we're on the side of the oppressed, not the oppressor. It destroys family relationships. It increases violence in the family, deception in the family. There's physical damage. You know, people who are multiply masturbating at the time and they're rousing. You know, this is the thing. They think this is something which is a part of a good self-life. No, you desensitize yourself. You damage yourself 
physically and as a result it has a direct link in terms of erectile dysfunction then you can't go on to have a normal sex life you're unable to then climax in a normal way so you, spirit, the spiritual damage is so clear it destroys your heart it destroys your ruh it destroys your siddhaq it destroys your taqwa it takes away your khushu it destroys your tahara it, this goes on in terms of the spiritual damage reputational damage you know, like I said, because of the, you don't want to get caught, it's all hidden. Middle of the night, no one's there. But you'll get caught. Your reputation is at stake. It destroys, like I said, it distorts your sexuality. You know, you, you, don't, you prefer porn to your, mar your wife that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, so you're doing zulm to her. Believe the lies, you know, you believe the lies and the lifestyle that porn promotes. So you're also bought into a lifestyle. You know, you've allowed shaitan to control you. You've rewired your brain, okay? You're involved in secret behavior and you become addicted to this whole aspect of behavior. So this is, you know. Now, one of the aspects of it, and then I'm gonna come, uh, one of the aspects of the pornification of society is that it's destroyed masculinity. You see, for us, the embodiment of masculinity is the Prophet Sallallahu He's described how to be a man, rijal. And we have our code of conduct around this al maruwa and al fatuwa which is about chivalry, protecting. For us, masculinity is about balance, of using our physical characteristics to protect and to safeguard, to give justice to the creation, to work hard, to be role models. That's masculinity. Not to be someone who is there, driven by base desires, that long list of stuff. Is that masculinity? Or is it completely end of masculinity? Robert Jensen, another advocate and uh, academic in this area, he says, porn is the end of masculinity. It destroys it. We're going backwards centuries, okay, because of this porn that is out there. And porn is just out there to facilitate one thing. It's just facilitating, you know, uh, uh, masturbation for men. That's it. It destroys intimacy because you now believe in force and violence. And this is the saturation of this particular industry out there. Uh, he goes on to say 50% of physical, in his uh, uh, research on porn, he identified that 80% of the scenes in porn have a physical and verbal abuse element to it. Okay, and uh, you know, in what involving hitting, gagging, choking, language, and things like this. Uh, you know, and so it teaches men that masculinity is dominance through force, humiliation, argumentation, insulting, and it, it, it basically it says that you know masculinity is about torturing, humiliating, degrading, and so therefore it destroys it. Islam, alhamdulillah, it teaches us how to be a real man. Real man, as the Prophet, some, as, as we know, rahmatullahi alameen, his mercy to all the world. Masculinity is about, okay, you know, mercy and kindness and softness and forbearance. This is mercy, uh, this is masculinity. That's not, it's about modesty before Allah and his creator. It's about generosity, karam. It's about safeguarding and protecting others. It's about protecting the weak and the dis disenfranchised. So this is again why Robert Johnson says that porn is an anti-human exploitative behavior. And finally, Philip Zimbardo is a very, very famous psychologist. He also talks about this called thing, the demise of guys. And he talks about this, that this whole, whole culture, internet gaming, uh, internet gaming and porn has destroyed Okay, uh, you know, young people. But he said by the age of 21, kids have spent 10,000 hours of watching gaming, internet, and all this kind of stuff. And this has destroyed their social skills. Rewired, he says, he calls them digitally rewiring of the brain. Because they're so used to this arousal on the online medium that they don't know how to function in the real medium. That's it, we, don't, we find that now. And he shows that, he says, girls, women are outperforming men in college, in universities, in all of this. This is a complete demise of guys. So this is Philip Zimbardo, he's a very, very famous uh, American social psychologist. Uh, and he talks about this, this, the, the impact that it's having in terms of destroying social skills. I want to move on now in terms of the porn and rain. I've got two more aspects I'm going to cover. In, uh, you know, I want to talk first about the pornification of society. Now I want to talk a bit about uh, the, the, the impact of, of pornography on the actual brain, what it actually does. Now, the whole issue of, uh, you know, porn addiction is related to a chemical, a neurotransmitter in the brain. It's called dopamine. Dopamine is the, uh, is the basically, you know, it, it's a neurotransmitter that is responsible for our motivation it gives us a euphoric state, makes us feel high and feel really good. So whenever we have any pleasure, 
if it's like eating your favorite food, being with your favorite people, all of that kind of stuff, then what it does is that you have a dopamine release and it gives you a motivation. Makes you, it's called feel good factor. And dopamine, that's why dopamine is linked to most addiction. Cocaine, for example, same as porn. In fact, in the research it shows that climaxing on porn and cocaine, that you know, there is, you know, cocaine gets to give you a bigger high, but you know, porn comes very close to it. But what's interesting about after the, the, the cocaine high is a very quick low, whereas with porn it kind of continues. There's a, this idea of what you call, uh, you know, it, it, you know uh, the, the actual term is edging. You know, you're able to kind of sustain the high with a porn high as opposed to other high. This, makes it, this is what makes it more addictive. And what happens is this, because of dopamine, you see, and so uh, dopamine is this drug, and so when you're watching porn, guess what? Massive dopamine surge in the brain. You're feeling really good. And then, you know, obviously when you're aroused, you come to a climax and you have an orgasm as well, because of self, uh, like I said, uh, pleasuring. Then you have a massive dopamine release in the brain. And then, you, like I said, by content, and then when you have that high, obviously you come down. But then you've got access to the high again. Now, the, when I explain this form of addi how addiction works, any addiction, I always say, like for men now, you know, for men, imagine you're driving around your favorite car, you've got your Ferrari out, yeah, there's a Ferrari, you're driving a Ferrari for a day. When you drive a Ferrari for a day, you know, I'm not saying, how is that going to make you feel driving a Ferrari for a day? Good? Buzz. Because you're getting all that dopamine surge in your brain. When you put the foot down, what's going to go on mm, that sign, yeah, and all that? It gives you a big, big rush. Next day, you're going to have to drive your Vauxhall Corsa. <laughs> okay? Yeah, where are you going from there to where? No. Hero to zero. Now, the one who's weak, he wants to get back into the Ferrari. But you haven't got access to the Ferrari. If you become addicted, then you, become pre then you see this aspects of addiction, preoccupation, okay, you know, obsession, compulsion, all these other things. You start, oh, I need the money to get the Ferrari, I need the money to get the Ferrari. Then, then the next time you get into the Ferrari, guess what? Do you know what? It wasn't the same pleasure as the first time I drove it. So I need to drive it for longer to get the same. It's called tolerance. It's the next, ac next aspect of addiction. You get the first buzz, then you develop a tolerance. So you need more of it to get the same buzz as before. So it starts to then control your life. And that's the thing. You see, porn, the access of porn is so easy. It's not like a Ferrari. You get your first hit, you come down, then you go for the next hit. It wasn't as good as the first time, because the material isn't as hard. So I need harder and harder material and more and more of it. Can you see now how it starts to take over your life and become addictive and totally dominate you because of the... And then there's a feedback loop, you see, you know, with the dopamine and the reinforcement around having that buzz coming down and all the behavior which is kind of associated. I'm simplifying it just to make it easy for everyone to understand. Essentially, that is it. And therefore, you associate with porn pleasure, not pain. Pleasure, not pain. So therefore, you always will go back to this. Now, this is actually uh, something which is called, you know, uh, you know so, so porn keeps what you call dopamine surging. It's called synthetic stimulation. And as a result of that, you see, why it's more addictive is because what it is is that you can continue to keep yourself edging. You can keep that, that dopamine level as high as possible by, you see, one of the, what porn addicts learn to do is this, that as they watch porn, they arouse themselves, but they do not come to climax. And then they continue to search as more and more porn, so they prolong this period of a dopamine high. Now, I, I, as everyone knows, when, they, when you have dopamine highs, when you're artificially affecting your, uh, uh, your brain chemistry in this way, this has a long-term impact in terms of your emotional and psychological and neural well-being. So this is what I'm saying. Now, wh when you watch pornography, the impact of that is that it leaves chemical pathways in your brain. So watching it, there's a chemical reaction in the brain then that leaves that trace. That's why that leaves that mental imprint in there. And it's just like the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that when you sin, Allah places a black spot upon your heart. It's a stain upon your heart. It's the same when you watch porn, the chemical reaction in your brain leaves a pathway in you. It rewires what they call neural pathways. It actually causes these, and there's a very good uh, site out there. It's called, you know, Your Brain on Porn, and it explains all of this in, in, you know, with very good, kind of, in great detail. So therefore it creates new neural pathways, new neural connections. 
and, it, and this is called neuroplasticity and neurotoxicity. So what it is, as a result of that, what wasn't there before, now you have a trace in that. And that's similar to the concept that we have in Islam about fitra. We are all born upon a pure fitra. And then it's our parents who make us into one religion or another religion. Yani the purity of our fitra is therefore affected by influences in our life, i.e. it causes taint. It causes, you know, uh, like I said, uh, you know, uh, ir ir you know, irreversible trends or irreversible patterns to take place in terms of our biological and neurological programming. That's what it does. This is also quite amazing because there are theories which state that this, this neurological pathway stays there. And this is what Allah will hold to account. When Allah says, in the sam'a wal basara wal fuwada, kullu ulaika kanu anhu mas'ula. The seeing, the hearing, the contemplation of every single one of you, Allah will inquire into it. Because everything is in the brain, recorded with chemical pathways and neural synapses and these neural pathways that Allah Ta'ala has got. I don't want to get too much into this. Now, just to give you an idea of the biological basis of this as well, is that something called the Coolidge effect. This is a biological programming principle that they did. It's only an animal research, but it's the same principle that says. And this is when they had animals, rats in particular, that were mating with a one single mate. When they were mating with one mate, after that mating process was over, they lost interest. They lost interest. But then when they, after that, when you put in what we call a novel mate, a completely new mate into that, their interest then goes up. And the interest continues to go up, by putting in more and more new mates into that rat cage. So the one male rat, when he has one female rat, you know, his, his interest is down. Put a new rat in there, interest goes up. New rat in there, interest goes up. New rat, interest goes up. This is called the Coolidge effect. And it revives the interest of the gnat. Why? Because then that rat is getting a big dopamine buzz every time a new female is coming into that, into that cage. This is what porn does. It provides you access to a new female every... And that's why guys who watch porn, this is the behavior they have. They watch page after page after page. They go from one to another. They get hit from one hit, 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 and going more extreme, harder, 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 more degrading, more, like I said, perverse, more sicker and sicker and sicker, because the old stuff doesn't interest them anymore. And so this is, again, uh, you know, all down to the dopamine mechanism that we have. Now, and, and as a result of that, so when they go back to their normal sex life, okay, when they go back to their wife, uh, they're not able to sustain a healthy relationship with her. It, if anything, it completely destroys that. You know, they can't, they go, and, in the, and there was a big Australian study that was done on this, and what they found is that guys who collected porn never went back to the porn that they collected. They're always looking for more extreme material, because the same old porn that they had did not stimulate the same dopamine release that they wanted. They wanted more and more arousal. And it's that arousal feedback mechanism that is what is the addictive part. And that's why the porn industry, like I said, porn went mainstream, so the porn industry went more extreme, more bizarre, more kinky, more, more what is it, uh, unlimited in terms of what it can offer to the people. And so this is what they call the twin turbo effect. You know, it keeps dopamine surging through the synthetic, and as a result of this, you lose interest in what is it. And, and that's why women who have husbands, it's, not, it's a really tragic thing. They are what we call porn widows. You know, as a result of their husbands watching this particular, and it completely destroys the relationship, it creates mistrust and all of these things, uh, you know, in, in, in that particular uh, kind of relationship. So that's basically how the uh, kind of brain, the, the, the kind of neurological processes work. Now the symptoms of porn addiction, this is can show you that you know you that individual is falling first they lose interest in real respect in real sex i.e with their wife uh, they lose interest in this it becomes something they're desensitized to because this desensitization they're not getting the same buzz they're not getting the same dopamine level as they were by having hit after hit after new after new after new as i mentioned so they need you know uh, like i said and this is again creates a disrespect it's like this is what i'm saying it's anti-woman it's anti-sex is anti-marriage, is anti all of these things because the person is selfish and self-centered, has no karam or generosity. See, so the sexual act between a husband and wife is karam, love, mercy, and it destroys that. You know, uh, so it creates that negative masculinity. Now, also, what they found is that the symptoms of porn the person becomes preoccupied, hours, they fail their exams, it becomes an obsession. And this is why, again, part of the reprogramming process, you can only 
The only, the, all of this, the psychosexual work and this, they say you only reprogram yourself from this addiction by completely abstaining. Now Allah says in the Quran, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيْنَ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَقَرَّ عَلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفَسُوكَ وَالْإِسْيَانِ Allah has made beloved to the believers Iman and has beautified it in their hearts. So for a believer, we love what is good and righteous. And we hate that which is of it, disbelief, sinning and transgression. So this is it, you have to abstain and have a hatred or a disgust for this particular nature because that's the only way you start changing the chemical pathways in your brain in relation to that. If you have one iota, even the slightest liking, not likening for it, it's a gravitational pull back to it. You will be pulled back to it. And because of the obsessive compulsion nature of it, people, and again, other symptoms, people lose their jobs. It causes you to lose your control. And people do relapse, even when people do leave it, then they're going back to it and back to it. And often people have some, some people have what we call a porn binge, which is again that they just like binge drinking, they'll spend hours and hours. I had one referral from the mental health team here, who was a young man who was watching it six hours a day, and he was masturbating about seven or eight times a day. And you know, let me tell you, there was no, he was in no, it was, there was no pleasure, it was just pure obsession and addiction. Now one of the ways I got him off it, it's because he was isolated. He didn't have a social network, a positive social network of people. So it was about introducing him to him to a positive social network. The other thing, he was a Muslim boy. His mum and dad were stopping him from getting married. We know that we have ways to prevent this hijab. Obviously, you know, the issues around uh, hijab, haya, marriage, all of these things. And I'm going to touch on them in a minute in relation to the protective measures that we have. But if parents are stopping their child from getting married for cultural reasons, as is often the case, and the, you know, this is a person who is very sexually repressed. He's not excusing it, but this is a manifestation of this particular behavior. You know, he was isolated. He needed friends, positive friends, good friends, and he wanted to be involved in more of a social life rather than, you see, this is what happens with porn addicts. They become isolated. And then they find other porn addicts that they connect with, not good companions. And that then compounds them in their, uh, what is it, uh, porn addiction. But not only that, there's another worst aspect of it as well, because there are people who are predatory pedophiles out there who seek other like-minded individuals so that they can watch porn together and be involved in the next steps of porn, which are then to try to put, try to put this into practice by grooming and identifying vulnerable children out there to, to abuse as well. So this is, again, an aspect of it. So what I did with this particular young man is I noticed he was, you know, if he can spend six hours doing this kind of stuff a day, I got him to do a 15 minute hour high intensity workout with kettlebells. He was absolutely knackered. He had no energy left. So there was no way he was going to do anything after that. So this is about physical sport and activity. You know, for our kids now, unfortunately, spend too much time playing with his thumbs and not enough time out there doing proper sports and recreation. I'm telling you, you know, that, that, that is a very positive thing. Now, Symptoms, erectile dysfunction, orgasm problems, people can't climax, so again it causes this, depression, anxiety and stress, emotional well-being is affected, why? Because people who watch porn are affected by emotions of guilt, of fear, of secrecy, okay, that's why they, you know, and it's so, people are so guilty, they're conflicted, they know what they're doing is bad, they don't want anyone to find out of it, these are not good emotions. That's why a lot of the individuals I work with with psychosexual problems, are sometimes often have a porn addiction history. Okay, in particular when people have premature ejaculation. Again, one of the aspects of this is that porn, because it's a secretive behavior, it's something to do secret, something that you want to do quickly. And as a result of that, then that then has an impact in terms of how they get conditioned in their, in their, uh, you know, in their married sex life. So this is again some of the uh, effects of that. Another aspect of the symptom of porn addiction is people need porn to start feeling good. It's just like the same, same thing I said about drugs. People need that drug, that spliff, that line whatever, to feel good, and it's the same thing, it makes them feel good. Physical harm and damage, they're getting tired, socially excluded and withdrawal. A lot of people who are watching our dicks also lose their self-esteem and confidence. They lose their inability to have positive social skills to relate to people. It also, because of the dopamine mechanism here, dopamine, as I said, affects motivation. But if your motivation, do dopamine feedback mechanism is only related to pornography, it's only porn that motivates you. Everything else demotivates you, so you have lower motivation. This is described by a lot of theorists as what they call brain fog. This inability to really think straight. And that's why this type of addiction is no different. And that's why it's haram, just like all the other forms of addiction, is no different than what Allah says in the Quran. Innama al khamru wal maysaru. You know, khamr, alcohol, and al maysar gambling. See, khamr, it comes from the word yakhmur, it means brain fog. 
befuddling of the mind. Something that puts a covering over the mind which causes you to inability to rationalize and think straight. So that's what porn it does the same thing as that. Uh, desensitization uh, causes your dopamine receptors, as I said, they decline. Okay, uh, increased tolerance means that you need more of intensity, nerve ending sensitive, all that kind of stuff, yeah. Uh, so what can we do about this now? So is there a way we can reboot, rewire the brain? And yes, there is, of course. Like I said, although you know, a lot of theories around porn addiction, what they'll say is that it's irreversible, the stain. And that's why I say to my young brothers here, and parents, protect your children as much as you're possible from ever being exposed to this material. Because w when you're exposed to it, it leaves a stain. As I said, it's regrettable that in our society it's gone mainstream. You see, you know when we talk about free mixing, when we talk about these matters, and, and I'm going to talk about what Allah Ta'ala, look at the etiquette Allah says in the Quran, قُلِ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُغُدُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُونَ فَرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِلُ مِمَا يَسْنَعُونَ And Allah says, tell the believing man to lower their gaze and protect their private parts, this is purer for them. So the etiquette for the Muslim man, lowering of the gaze. You know, we don't do it in this society. We're desensitized. You see, lowering of the gaze means you know, when you watch TV, you know, there are women there who are even, you know, on, on current affairs programs, women who are sexualized even on current affairs programs, you know, on, on what, even on children's TV, subhanAllah. You know, billboards, magazines, everywhere. And we're desensitized to that. So we've already, on a global level, this is a global epidemic, we've already become desensitized. You know, magazines are in our, and we are scantily clad women, we watch and see Anna all the time. And we're desensitized to that, just goes to show you the neuroplasticity that, you know, our brain, can, you know, so it's already happened. Let's minimize this, you know, ittaqullah mustata'atum, as much as we can. We have to try to minimize the impact on this, so that our children don't have to therefore rewire. So the rewiring of the circuitry of the brain, the rebalancing of the brain, we can reverse it and we can re return back to normal uh, sensitivity. Alhamdulillah, you know, we are able to do this uh, and change, the, you know, the patterns of the brain. And the way that we do this reversal process is by avoiding pornography, avoiding the behaviors that mimic pornography, avoid surfing as much as possible, that increases it, and that, um, uh, uh, avoid the fantasizing. Because even though you stop, your brain, and that's why I said, You've got to hate it. You've got to have a dislike for what this is. That's why the, when I go through the whole idea of what is this actual medium, this is not people of any kind of decency will entertain. So don't have a fantasy about this. This is wicked and reprehensible. You've got to avoid the associations. <coughs> You've got to avoid the companions. Keep away from people who are also involved in this. You've got to start doing other experiences which build new, new positive neural pathways. And one thing about this kind of thing is this, that you know, the nature of muscle memory, like I said, is that although you've developed, you know, you will have a withdrawal. Just like with lots of drugs, there's withdrawal. You feel irritable, discontented, I want to go back, and then there's that pull back, you've got to fight that. Because the dopamine, you want that dopamine rush in your brain again. You've got to fight that. And the one thing about, you know, neural pathways is that when you stop using them, you lose them. You can either use it or lose it, as they say. You know, uh, so therefore, if you stop doing it, then that pathway is still there, but it becomes dormant. You know, it, it gets lost. And, and one of the important ways is that you have to associate watching porn with pain, with punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the adhab of Allah in this world in an akhirah. It is zina. That's, and Allah says in the Quran, He doesn't just say, although Allah says, Wala yaznun, don't make zina, but Allah ta'ala, he says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْرِبُ الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاهِشَةً وَسَاءَ السَّبِيلِ Do not even come Karib close to it. The zina of the eyes is looking and not lowering the gaze. The zina of the ears is listening. The zina of the tongue is talking indecently. The zina of the hands is the keyboard searching for the porn on Google. That's the zina of the... All of this. Don't even come close. You're desensitizing yourself and it will lead to the next stage. The minor sins will lead to the major sins, the qaba'ir. And so therefore, don't even come close to this. So you have to associate porn with pain, with evil, with wickedness. Because people, if they associate with pleasure, then that's the... Yeah. So we can reverse the process. And we can, you know, there is increased, uh, like I said, uh, you know, we can challenge this. 
and, and one of the ways we challenge it is, as I mentioned, we have to understand what is going on. As I've explained, when you understand this is what's going on with the process, it is deliberately designed. Porn is deliberately designed because they, you know, there's a lot of theories which say men's brains, and obviously women watch porn as well, but the whole issue of women watching porn is more, you know, less women, it's really the, a male issue. Men's brains are designed to find the female form attractive. That's the way they were designed to do this. And so therefore when it's presented in this way, of course it has that dopamine rush. When you understand what, how you are being reeled in and how you are being made addictive to something and the addictive process of what's taking place, again, you can start rationalizing how I can reverse this or how I can change this and how I can start to desensitize. And so understanding the mechanism is very important to discard the, the, the bad habits and acquire healthy habits. So we need to take a rest okay, uh, you know, from this uh, and uh, you know, from artificial stimulation, this fantasy world. Part of that rest is obviously avoiding masturbation. It's very important that you avoid that because again, by doing that, you know, then you go inevitably one thing will then lead to another thing. Breaking the associations, substituting with the positive. And this is why, alhamdulillah, al -Din provides a framework to dealing with porn addiction. Because it provides a holistic framework in which we develop the mind with the intellect, with the knowledge that we have been given. We develop the body by maintaining the balance in the body. We develop the soul by the dhikr of Allah and reflecting upon Allah and thinking about the Creator and our accountability before the Creator and being aware that our actions are before Allah. And we develop positive social networks through brotherhood, through positive family networks. So our deen provides a holistic solution because it provides a complete way of life which is a complete alternative to that way of life. We have to ask ourselves, why do people need this in the first place? Because they have empty lives often. People with addictions have empty lives that cause them to gravitate towards this behavior. And you know, obviously by having a complete alternative, they're able to challenge this. Tawbat al-Nasuha, sincere repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a reboot process. Because it replaces what you thought was pleasure with pain. You realize this was disobedience to Allah. And your pleasure is only to obey Allah. And your displeasure is to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why, you know, it's, this is the rebooting. Now Tawbah, as we know, has three qualities. And it's all part of your first you know, three conditions of the individual. First. You hate it. You have to have a revulsion for it. You've got to abstain immediately. Not delay the tawbah, not delay it, but do it straight away. Distance yourself from all of the things which will pull you back. Thirdly, follow up a bad deed with a good deed and it wipes it, wipes it away. So this means creating new actions, new activities, which create new neural pathways, positive things in your brain, which wipe that. As I said, when you stop using the bad stuff, Replace it with lots, layers and layers of good, positive neural pathways. And where the dopa dopamine feedback mechanism is based on motivation from doing hasanat, good deeds. Do you know when you make the hajjud and you, buy, you, know, you, you give up your, your sleep and afterwards you get a buzz, no one's there, it's just you and your creator, that's dopamine. But a positive dopamine, not the, the negative dopamine that we're talking about here. So just inshallah also, you know, just to, to finish with, you know, as I said, our etiquettes, in Islam, as I said, haya is half of our religion. And this is something which destroys the haya. Allah says in the Quran, don't come close to zina, as I've mentioned. So we don't even come close to it. They're close to any of the influences which are associated with it. Okay, and also, we take pride. You see, a lot of this is about peer pressure for us. Allah says in the Quran, hum li furujihim hafidun, And those who guard their chastity and their private parts. For us, our pride comes from what? It comes from being pure for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, on the street, the youth, the language they use, the behavior they have, they think that acceptability is by being promiscuous, by pimping themselves out, by being loose, by being people who lose and give it up. No, that is dishonor. And that is disrespect. And that is disrespecting what Allah Ta'ala. We need to reverse the paradigm where our young people, lil mutakina imama, leaders of the righteous, by saying, no, I have pride because I protect myself from these influences. And I keep myself pure for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. As I mentioned, Allah says, lowering of the gaze. And I will say, you know, you will not incur the respect of your peers until they see this noble characteristic of you of lowering of the gaze. 
you know, uh, and so this is very important that we, we have this particular bill. And also, just a few more points, you know, as I said, this whole field of work is also about protection and safeguarding of women. Islam is the religion which protects the izza of women. Because the term ummah, it comes from the root word um, which means mother. So we believe the woman is the mother of a nation. And that's why we honor the mother and every potential mother. And that's why when the Prophet said, Istosu bin Nisa khayla, treat women with kindness. You know, that's why, you know, we have this honoring of women. He said, the best of you in akhlaq are those who are best to him, women. And he says, I have uh, declared, uh, what is it, uh, inviolable the rights of two, al yatim wal marrah, the orphan and the women. So women are to be protected and safeguarded from these particular evil things which are out there in society. It is for us. Now, when I did this research on this, on, on, on this particular lecture, you know, um, what was interesting was that many of the sites which are out there, which are anti-porn sites, anti-porn addiction sites, are actually run by Christians, Christian organizations, feminists, uh, you know, people who obviously are anti-porn, you know, because they see the evil of that. I came only across one or two Islamic sites that were dealing with this particular issue. And they weren't even dealing with it, they just had something on this. Who are supposed to be shuhada al nas? You know, who are the ones who are supposed to be giving this witness to mankind? Who are the ones supposed to be protecting these rights? Protecting morality of society? So this is a real important campaign, jihad, to fight the P-bomb and fight the porn industry and its corrosive and evil, reprehensible okay, materials which are going to destroy or which are destroying society and masculinity. And we pray, Ya Allah, keep our youth safe from this evil influence and make us means to spread this goodness to humanity. Jazakallah khair for your time and for listening, inshallah. If there's any questions or inshallah any comments, uh, you know, you're welcome. Well, it's still not easy, even if you're a drug addict, subhanAllah, yeah, that's right, yeah. But where, you know, what kind of support network? Is None. Okay. None. That's the real, I, obviously as a counsellor I get my case load, and, and, and I, people who come to me, you know, they've, they've lived, suffered in silence for many, many years. It's destroyed their lives and their families' lives. And, you know, I, I, I find it difficult to manage the caseload. People from all over the country, literally, you know, calling me up and, and uh, you know, inquiring about these particular matters. So we need to develop capacity in our community to deal with it. One of the initiatives that I'm involved with at the moment is that we are, and we have a session in Leicester on the 12th of May, and that is that we are going to be training local mentors. So I come and I train about 10 or 12 people in how to do this support work with young people. In particular, there's a couple of risk issues. Drugs, sexual abuse, gangs, violence, criminality, disaffection. Those are some of the risk issues out there around our young people. It's not just this one. This is one amongst many issues out there. And so we need to have mentors, like I said, uncles and aunties, who will provide the support for our shabab and for our, our community on these issues. Uh, counsel them, guide them, give them befriending, just help them into, to, so that they can, and let me tell you, it's not rocket science. Lots of times, it's just, it's just someone wants to talk to someone about this. And you know, most of the kids that I work with never had it. I had a case now of one 14 year old who was uh, chronically uh, masturbating, addicted to this particular material. His parents didn't know what was going on. And he committed, you know, he did something quite very, very bad. And he, anyway, I'm gonna go into the details of it, but I'm the first person he spoke to about these particular issues. First person. Even with the young offenders that I work with, first time they've ever sat down and had a discussion with someone about this, who's just able to give them the kind of basic moral lessons and, and encourage them to do what is right and not follow 
their peers and be leaders and not followers as I say so we can do something we can I'm not gonna be negative we haven't we're not dealing with the challenge at the moment we got to go, we got to start dealing with the challenge inshallah I'm gonna be doing this lecture across the country alhamdulillah and uh, uh, you know and our key role is that in everywhere we're gonna try to develop as many mentors as possible who can then provide this guidance and support to potential addicts and potential vulnerable people in our community Allah give us the ability to do this inshallah Amen. We are not keeping up to date with the technology and the challenges of the technology. The technology is ahead of us. And I believe you can't really you can't, govern, you, you know, you, you, you can put all the, a lot of the uh, protective software in place and you can do that. But I think ultimately you need to educate and be role models for your children from a very young age. That's the only way I'm dealing with a case, you know, when, it, when it, someone's mid-teens really to try to then put boundaries on them then when you didn't put boundaries on them before, you know. Let me give you an example. That, uh, this is a similar example. There was a father and you know he's one or two year old two year old yeah he started swearing using the f word and when he used the f word guess what they all laugh it's think they think it's cute he's going to prison i'll see him in prison in 16 years time that's it you didn't put a boundary there and now you want to put a boundary later on but i'm not talking about I, people yeah. i'm talking about yeah. kids yeah young kids who you allow to go on a computer yes and who are not purposely going on to go to yeah. these sites Absolutely. Maybe they might come by chance by an advert, by a click. Yes. Here or there. Yeah, alhamdulillah. No, no, jazakallah khair, yeah. Yeah, no, and, and for this, definitely have ad block on all of your uh, browsers. Good, you know, uh, Mozilla Firefox ad block is very good. It takes out all of the adverts. You don't even see them. And most of these adverts, like I said, they have uh, are pornographic material. Don't let your children use the internet as children unless there's a reason for doing it. Why are they on there? And this is what I'm saying, we are disconnected from our children. We're not, we're not reading books to them, we're not going out to the park with them, we're not doing activities with them, we're not talking with them. We just allow them, this is the American model of just being supervised by Xbox, by TV, by satellite, and, all. and don't bring these things into your house, that's all I can say. It's difficult, but uh, don't bring them into your house. Don't bring satellite TV into your house. Don't bring, you know, things. Don't give your ch children mobile phones. They don't need mobile phones. They don't need smartphones. You know, I, I had an uncle, he, he told me, you know, smartphones has destroyed our youth. They have. They, as a device, what it's capable, you know, you can't govern the device. Even if you did block on it, they make Bluetooth porn to them. And this isn't just here, this is all, this, you know, I had it in Middle East countries, there was the same thing they were saying to me, they were, what they were doing. So, you know, your, ch your children don't need mobile phones. They need them when they need them. You know, when they're later teens, and they, they need it for that reason. But the key thing is, that, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, in my family, you know, we've managed to avoid all of this fitting. Alhamdulillah, even in good families, this stuff happens, you know. Okay, by making sure that the, your children are good companions, a good Islamic environment. Core values are there of haya, of taqwa, of iman. It's embedded into them. They know rights and wrongs. They know about respect for women. And you talk to your children about the issues. So they're aware of these issues. And then inshallah, this is your protection. And the child who's gone uh, astray, and then you start to put boundaries on them will rebel even more. In my experience, that's what, you, what ends up happening. So don't leave it too late. You know, there's a very good, zero to seven is raham, mercy, love. Seven to, you know, 11 you could say is your core tarbiyah. Put strong values in there. And the learning is often, Parenting, children learn from imitating their primary role models, mum and dad. If you are inconsistent, then that's what's going to happen to your children. And then, in their teenagers, then it's just to be ashab with them, good companions with them, and do things with them, you know, and, and continue. Enrichment is so important. When our children are enriched, positive activities, social programs, sport programs, recreational programs, they've got time for anything else. Educational programs, alhamdulillah. 
Our kids are isolated, left alone, left to their own devices, and we are being, obviously, so these are part of the problems. But I, I'm not an expert on all the softwares, alhamdulillah, and I know that one of our brothers, we did run e-safety uh, uh, workshops for parents before, and we gave them software and things like that. Perhaps, alhamdulillah, we can do that. It's free, the software. We can get out there, and we can do it. But unfortunately, children who want to do this, especially on social media, that's on the porn side, but children who are addicted to Facebook have found ways to circumvent this through their friends and through other ways. And, and, and generally, you know, uh, because the values are not there. You have to put the core values, inshallah, and iman there, and then that will police your children. That's what they will, they will police themselves rather than you police them. That's the ideal situation, inshallah. Yeah. In this society, you know, it's like everyone goes away from marriage, but should we be encouraging our children to get married early, to try and avoid all of have good relationships? Um, I, absolutely. No, I totally agree with you, brother. Alhamdulillah. You know, look, we are dealing with a new challenge. And if children have to wait 20, mid 20s and all the stuff to get married, this is highly problematic in an over sexualized society. If children want to get married after the age you know, of 18 and they want, they're ready to get married and we've given them all the guidance and support, get them married. Alhamdulillah. If you don't, this is fitna. Simple. It's, it's, we have the solution. You know, it's haya, modesty, it's hijab, it's marriage, it's covering of the aura, all of these things, we have the solution. Satar, you know, that's why, you know, we should have this, you know, we see someone uncovered, it's, you know. All the solutions are there, we're not doing, we're not following them. And of course, marriage is really important, you know. Let your children get married at a young age. Don't use cultural patterns of behavior which, you know, force them to marry people they're not happy with because that creates problems or you know they have to wait till they've got a job or a house and all the materialistic things in their late 20s and then they're repressed so no you know let them we should be encouraging marriage from a young age inshallah i heard the chef talking um, he said he wanted his son at the age of 15 16 to get married so is that is that getting you know is that too young not in this country you can't do it till the age of 16 so that's important you know we make that clear you know what it is, is that every child is different. Every child is unique. No, you're 16 with the consent of the parents, yeah? So, uh, or I might be wrong, 16 or 18, well, anyway. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 16, 16, yeah. Uh, and every child is unique, every child is different. Some can wait till their mid-20s, alhamdulillah. And some can't. So, you know, you have to take into that account of each. And each child needs to, you see, I always say, our children, they need to have what I call a comprehensive marriage course before they're married. You know, I'm not talking about one hour lecture, I'm talking about three months minimum of tarbiyah on what it means to be a married man. And then afterwards we continue to support them, inshallah, in their married life. And you know, this is a blessing, this is a great thing in our community, that we have young people, happy, married, responsible, bringing up families. It's a brilliant, brilliant and beautiful thing. We've gone away from that. Made marriage a jihad, a struggle for our kids. They can't even get married, so they're making zina instead. You know, so this is a reality. We've created this fitna, inshallah, unfortunately. So we've got to start to deal with the future challenges by, you know, obviously looking for the solutions which are already in our religion, inshallah. Okay, brothers, it's time for Salat al-Maghrib. We'll close it there. Jazakallah khair, wallahu alam. Subhanaka Allah, wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha. Ant astaghfiruka wa atubu alaik wa salamun ala al-musaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.